Okay, thank you, everybody. We are going to continue now with Amber Ahern, Keto Carnivore. What's wrong with anecdotal evidence? Let's welcome Amber. Thank you. So this is a bit of a departure from the talks that I normally give. I've been so endlessly fascinated with the realization that humans have this apparently unique species ability to maintain ketosis even without having any kind of nutrient or caloric deprivation. And so a lot of my talks have been about the, the relationship evolutionarily between eating meat and ketosis and the development of the brain and the adipose tissue. But today I'm going to talk about logic which has the great advantage that we can actually do experiments together right here from your armchairs. So here is a, an anecdote. It was discovered in 2016 that there was a woman named Maisie Strang who had reached the age of 102 and appeared to be completely healthy and she'd been smoking a pack a day for most of her life. So. Would this be what Richard would call a paradox? Does this mean that the idea that smoking makes you die younger is somehow disproven? Well, not, not exactly. But something's wrong with it. What, what can this story actually disprove? In order to figure that out, we're going to have to break it down a bit. So, suppose that this pink circle represents all smokers. I'm not talking about once a year on your birthday, but some level of habitual smoking. And suppose that everyone in this blue circle either is now or is going to be a centenarian of sound mind and agile body with no medications. So let's look at the possible ways that these sets of people can overlap and which one of those or ones of those Maisie will disprove. One possibility is that they're completely disjoint. So this means two things. It means if you're a smoker, you can't be a centenarian. And if you're not a smoker, that guarantees that you'll be a centenarian. Uh, well, Macy certainly just proves that. Another possibility is the opposite, complete overlap. This means that you will definitely be a centenarian if you smoke, and if you don't smoke, you won't. Well, Maisie's consistent with that idea. Uh, another possibility is that all centenarians are in this smoking circle. So you have to be a smoker, or you have to be a smoker to be a centenarian, but you, you won't necessarily be one. And Maisie's consistent with that. Another possibility is that all, uh, all Smokers will be centenarians, but there'll be some who don't smoke as well. And Maisie fits that. <laughs> and then there's this complicated case that applies to almost everything, right? All possibilities can happen. There are smokers who will be centenarians. There are smokers who won't. There are non-smokers who will be. There are non-smokers who won't. Uh, well, Maisie doesn't disprove this, but no one can disprove this, right? <laughs> um, it turns out that Maisie's anecdote isn't really very helpful for eliminating possibilities. The only, in fact, I think it's safe to say that we've all seen anecdotes, though, that would eliminate some of these possibilities. And the only one that's left is this really complicated case that doesn't give us very much useful information. So it's probably not a surprise to people that there are representatives of each of the kinds of cases that are in here. But what we really want to know is quantitative. We want to know how big each of these regions are. How much do these overlap? And single anecdotes can't help us with that at all. We want to know how likely it is that we could live healthily into our hundreds if we smoke. So that means that we have to wade into the murky realms of probability. Well, the, one of the dirty secrets about randomness is that science doesn't actually 
purport to believe in it. <laughs> Besides some areas of particle physics, the idea is that everything that happens actually has a cause based on other things that were there. And so in principle, if you knew all the laws of physics and the position of everything in the universe, you would be able to know everything that would happen for the rest of time. Now note that this is actually a faith-based assumption and it's, we can't prove or disprove it. And in fact, it's not very compatible with the idea of free will at all in any meaningful sense. So there are philosophers who think that that's wrong. But the scientific consensus is that um, the only reason that things ever look random is actually just because they're unpredictable, because we don't know where everything is. And possibly we don't know all the laws. So, this knowledge that things aren't truly random gives us a temptation to think when we see an anecdote like Maisie's that there's something really special about her. It's tempting to think that maybe there's something about her lifestyle, something about her genes, or some lucky incident that happened to her in the past that makes her invulnerable to the effects of smoking. But I'm going to show you how that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So let's take a very simple video game model of cancer. Now we're pretending here, right? Cancer isn't really a video game. Um, don't quote me on saying that. <laughs> but let's pretend that we have these cells and they have a buffer of health and they can take a certain amount of damage and stay healthy. But as soon as a certain threshold is reached, boom, the cell turn has turned cancerous and you lose the game. And you also have these damage eaters that can heal you. So let's suppose that in the game, you take hits from these weapons of mass destruction, and every day the cell can only heal from, say, five hits, and so the packaged smoker is gonna die before the day is over, and that's gonna happen deterministically. It's really not a very interesting game. But imagine if instead you had many cells, and this, this cannon is moving in such a way that it's not very predictable which of these cells it's gonna hit. So what happens is that it, the, the distribution of these hits usually comes out looking quite random. Um, and, and it's distributed in such a way that theoretically you could take a lot more damage. But notice that even in this random looking distribution, there's one cell that's been particularly unlucky and some cells that have been particularly lucky. And in this game, you only need one cell to be unlucky enough times to completely lose the game. Uh, you can imagine being really unlucky in one of these game's iterations where one cell gets hit over and over again without any of the other ones coming up. And it's not very likely that that's going to happen, but if you play enough times, you'll probably see something like that. And so there's really nothing special going on to get these different results, but just that there, there are a wide variety of games being played such that you'll see rare ones come up. And I would argue that that's what's happening with Macy. On the other hand, if we had two different players and one was smoking a pack a week and one was smoking a pack a day, it might be the case that if they are lucky about their distributions, both of them look completely healthy from the outside, but one of them is actually a lot more vulnerable to an unlucky streak, to something taking down their damage healers, um, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish that until the very end of the game. So sometimes an anecdote probably it really is useless. Looking at Maisie's diet or her genes maybe a red herring here. We don't actually need any extra explanation besides a little bit of math and unpredictability to explain what happened to her. Well, does this mean that all anecdotes are useless? How can you tell if an anecdote is actually getting you anywhere? So now we have to talk about statistics a little bit. People don't like the word statistics. It, it, uh, it's an intimidating word because there are really technical aspects to statistics. Um, it takes some expertise to get it right. But what it really is is a tool, and it's a tool in figuring out what, what 
the world is probably like when there's no way to really know. And statistics is a backwards kinds of science, and I say that in the most um, nicest way, really. <laughs> it's, it's backwards just mathematically. So here's a question for you. If you had a gigantic gumball machine filled with different colors, but you couldn't see inside it, and you didn't know how many of each there were, how many would you have to take out to have confidence that you know what the proportion is like inside? <laughs> so if you took out 10 and you got this, nine yellows and one blue, are you confident, like would you place a bet with somebody that 90% of the gumballs in there are yellow? How do you know you just didn't hit a yellow streak, right? You don't know that. Um, and how likely is it that these colors are, that there are colors in there that you've never seen before? Would this blow your mind if you suddenly got a red or was that possibility something you were carrying around? So the magic trick of statistics is that instead of directly extrapolating what you see and, and saying that that's a direct microcosm of what's inside, you actually um, start with a guess about the inside and then calculate how likely the outcome would be if that guess were right. And that's why it's backwards. So the key idea is that a result can only be surprising to you if it's different from what you expect. Your expectations before you go into something are technically called your prior probability, and they make a critical difference. So here's a made-up anecdote to explain what I mean. Suppose you're this little boy, your name is Andy, and you and your sister Anne have the privilege of having a giant gumball machine that your parents installed in your house. And if you do your chores, you're allowed to take a few turns and get a few gumballs every day. And so far, this has been going on for a couple of years, and you always get blue gum balls, and um, so you know that that's a blue gumball machine. But one night, in the middle of the night, you wake up from a nightmare, and you really want to go see your parents, and so you, you go toward their bedroom, and you pass the gumball machine, and you realize you have a chance to sneak a gumball while nobody's up. And so you turn the dial, and you get a red one. That's weird. <laughs> but you try it, and it's delicious. In fact, you like it better than the blue ones. <laughs> and, and you're not quite sure when you wake up in the morning if you've dreamt it, but you tell your sister about it, and it's, it's just bugging you. And finally, you two decide, you, you hatch a plan that you're going to meet at midnight and see what happens when you try to get another piece. Lo and behold, you both get red ones. So at this point, you might have a theory brewing in your mind. Maybe you're thinking, well, we always get blue in the day, and we always get red at night. Or maybe if you're more of a guilt-driven type of person, you're thinking, oh, I only get blue when I'm being good, and if I'm naughty, I get red. But in, in either case, these are really strong hypotheses, right? How many times would you have to get a contrary experience to completely dis, uh, disprove that theory? Just one, right? A single anecdote can always disprove a strong theory. But what if we replayed this? And if instead of it being the blue gumball machine all along, it had been giving you about half and half blue and red. In this story, if you wake up in the night and you take your secret little gumball <laughs> and you get red, you probably don't even give it another thought. And in fact, you could even imagine that there's a weird distribution where in the daytime they're 50-50 and in the nighttime they're always red or even worse, they're maybe 80% of the time red, it would take you a really long time to ever notice that there was any difference in those distributions if you ever noticed it at all. So let's flip over now to something we actually care about. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's imagine that this grid is like two giant gumball machines full of people. And all of the people in the machines are people who have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And the ones on the top row have been on a carnivore diet for a long time. I'm not going to define that long time yet. 
you know, ones on the bottom have never been on a carnivore diet. And, and just imagine that we had the ability to pick them out of the gumball machine and sort them into which grid they belong in, which square. Well, that would be great. That's way more information than we have right now. Because what we have right now is that we know that a few people exist in this square, right? So if you've even heard of it at all, which maybe you haven't, is that there's a person named Michaela Peterson and several other people who have said, I went on a carnivore diet and my rheumatoid arthritis went into complete remission. But without knowing anything else, it's really hard to know if that matters at all. Maybe it's just a case like Macy that we can, it's, it's just a fluke and we can completely ignore it. It would help a little if we knew how many people were in this square where you, you've tried a carnivore diet and it didn't do anything. Um, if that number is small, then it seems like we might really be onto something. And um, if it's big, then we're gonna be less confident. And this leads us to a problem that happens when we see anecdotes, which is called survivorship bias. So you can imagine a world where lots of people are trying the carnivore diet, including a lot of people with RA, and the people who it didn't do anything for just moved on to something else, and we never heard about it. And so to us, it looks like most people who go on a carnivore diet get this relief, when in fact that may not be the case. So doing a trial helps prevent this kind of underreporting. But what would be even better is if we had some kind of prior expectation. So this bottom row is like our daytime gumball machine, right? Um, if, if we knew what the actual rate of people just getting better from the rheumatoid arthritis rate was, then we'd know if this was extraordinary or not. I chose RA in particular because it's one, it, this is actually quite common in autoimmune diseases where they are known to sometimes go into spontaneous remission. And so someone who is very skeptical might say, well, it's just a coincidence that you started this diet at this time because you were about to go into remission anyway. But when, when I looked into what remission means for rheumatoid arthritis, I wasn't quite as satisfied with that explanation. I'll tell you why. So spontaneous remission is something that only happens to people who have very recently been diagnosed with RA, like within a few months. And when they have remission, it only goes away for a couple of months. And there isn't a lot of uh, agreement about how many people that happens to, um, depends on, I think, what your definition of remission is. So now we've got something where in the worst case scenario, it looks like maybe half and half people going into spontaneous remission. But this wouldn't say anything about someone who's had RA for a long time. As for uh, people who've been, had RA for a long time, there's another kind of remission. And if you're like me, you'll be quite upset by <laughs> finding out what this definition means. It's called drug-free remission. Sounds like it means they didn't take any drugs and they had remission, right? But that's not actually what it means. It means these people were treated with a drug for a long time and reached stability for a long time. And then they withdrew the drug and tested to see how long it took before they had another flare-up. And for those people, so that's already a small group, so most people don't get stable <laughs> on, on drugs. So then you take those people, and how many of them, um, a year after their drug was withdrawn, haven't had another flare-up? 40% close to, and that's, that's a pretty high number, um, but it's a very limited case. Uh, and if you take it out to 15 years, it goes to zero. So obviously, getting stabilized on a drug and then withdrawing it is not at all the same as spontaneous remission. But on the other hand, it does give some idea of how long the disease can linger before showing its head again. By the way, I want to emphasize that I'm not at all suggesting that Michaela's experience, or mine for that matter, I don't know if you know, but I'm in remission from bipolar disorder going on 10 years. Um, I'm not suggesting that that's not real. 
There are other reasons to make me personally suspect that the effect is real and promising, including the history, the whole history of those diseases and those people, and whether or not you can make it start and stop <laughs> at will. Um, but what I'm trying to point out is just that we can't really make sense of anecdotes without knowing what all these other data points would be, which is why it would be really great if we can get some controlled trials going. So some people would say, they, they would look at a story like Michaela's or mine and say, well, the effect's probably just due to placebo. And what they mean by that is that there's something about the carnivore diet and my personality, Michaela's personality, that somehow allows us to heal ourselves from within by some psychological mechanism. And it's not completely off the wall because everyone knows that your attitude can have an, a physical effect on your neurotransmitters and that this state could potentially have an effect throughout the whole body. But what's important to know is that the placebo effect has been studied and it has some very important limitations. So quantitative limitations, uh, it only works on things that are, have some amount of subjectivity and are hard to measure. Now, <laughs> that doesn't help us very much because mood and pain are two of those things. Um, it can only account for statistically small effects, it turns out. Nobody sees the placebo effect. Nobody sees someone going from suicidally depressed all the time to cheerful all the time. No one sees someone go from excruciating pain to completely pain-free. And as far as I understand, there's been no, no one has measured that a placebo effect could, could last and last and last for 10 years or, or, or anything like that. So an, another property of it is that a lot of studies where you're about to try an intervention comes at a time when people are as, as sick as they get. <laughs> and that means that, like, well, like the spontaneous remission idea, even if it's not a full remission, there is actually a good likelihood that you're about to get better to some degree. And getting better to some degree is called regression to the mean. And some people are actually uh, so convinced by the statistical pattern that placebo effects have had that they think, there's no psychological explanation necessary at all. It's all completely explainable by statistics. So even if there is a placebo effect, I think it's unlikely to account for the things that we're seeing. But let's go ahead and give benefit of the doubt. Let's say that there is some way that we can bootstrap our psychology to make us better. So things that we know from people who have studied it from that angle is that there seems to be uh, a component of ritual, the more ritualistic, the more sacrifice that you make, and the more empathy and support that you feel that you're getting are all things that are believed to help with the healing from the inside effect. But one thing that strikes me about this <laughs> is that there's a certain sense in which it really doesn't matter how it works, except that we'd really like to learn how to replicate it, right? So if it's true that the carnivore diet has some really special property that makes people able to use the placebo effect really effectively, then it doesn't really matter if that's a neurotransmitter effect or an intestinal permeability effect. It's something we'd probably like to know more about. Um, I think it would, <laughs> it would still be worth investigating. And you can imagine that there'd be some kind of personalization that would have to come into play, right? Um, because of that incident with the tarantula that you had when you were sick, six, and uh, the fact that your uncle, your favorite uncle is a sailor, we have determined that in order to get the best placebo effect for you, we have to give you periodic, regular spider bites on a yacht. Um, it's a bit pricey, but I do have a friend who I can hook you up with. Um, my cousin did it for her constipation, and she goes twice a day now. <laughs> Back many years ago, in 2012, Zuko and I started writing a blog about the 
science behind ketogenic diets. And we were really excited about it, but we were also a little bit nervous writing about it because we sounded like kooks. Because well, <laughs> who is going to try such a ridiculous sounding diet? So we were trying to collect all the scientific evidence that was emerging on the different therapeutic effects that could happen. But by far the most evidence that we were seeing were stories from people on, on many fora uh, on the many benefits that they were getting on a low carb diet. So we were thinking about what would compel somebody to try something that the evidence behind isn't as complete as we might like. And here are some of the things we came up with. So one is how much benefit is it going to give you? So the more you stand to gain, the more interested you would be in trying something kooky, right? Um, if, if you're talking about an intervention that might stop your migraines, chances are you're more interested in trying it than if it's about whitening your teeth, even if it's a long shot. And then how confident you are that the evidence that you've seen is going to apply to you comes into play. In this case, anecdotes are, are pretty weak evidence that you're going to try it and it's going to work for you. You might prefer an RCT, and you'd prefer an RCT that showed 90% success rate than one that showed only 10. And then the other thing is, what does it cost you? What's the risk? What's the opportunity cost of doing this? So if the intervention we're talking about is just adding a few teaspoons of salt to your diet, that doesn't cost very much, and unless you're worried about the supposed uh, blood pressure problems that this could cause, you're probably not worried about doing it. Now, cutting sugar out from your diet, that's a costlier thing because it takes away some pleasure and social things, but it, nobody's really worried that that's going to cause knock-on health problems. <laughs> On the other hand, if the intervention that you're thinking about trying costs $300 a month and might cause liver damage, that's a completely different kind of situation. And these interact, right? So if you have migraines, you're probably willing to try something with risk, even if the evidence is weak, or something, or, so, sorry, something with low risk and, and weak evidence, or something with high risk and only intermediate evidence. But if something's not very important to you, you're probably not going to take large risks, even if the evidence is quite solid. I don't care if 90% of the people who took this liver-damaging drug got whiter teeth. <laughs> it's not good enough. Well, you know, your values are your values. <laughs> so when you take risks into account, comparing an anecdote like Maisie's to an anecdote like Michaela's is in some ways like comparing cigarettes to meat. And who would do that? Thank you.